This dedication ceremony, rededication ceremony for the flag raising on Iwo Jima is very special to Marines. As a Marine, I know full well the significance of the horrendous battle, which has become the hallmark of the United States Marine Corps for as long as I can remember. This memorial signifies everything that is good and clean about America. The photographer who took the picture of these men raising the flag was Joe Rosenthal. They were bringing a second flag up. They had already raised a flag one time, and it was small. And so orders were given to send up a larger flag. And so Rosenthal and the cameraman who was shooting the film were sitting there facing away from the flag. The cameraman that was shooting film told Rosenthal, there it goes. Rosenthal swung around and shot almost a perfect composition. The angle of the flagpole is 45 degrees. The open space between man one and man two has knees and elbows jutting into that open area, which is reflected against the sky. You couldn't have posed that thing. It became the most important image of World War II. It remains so today. The Iwo Jima Monument was modeled by Felix de Weldon. Felix de Weldon uh, was also called the Michelangelo of America. When that iconic photograph came into the Navy Department and Felix de Weldon saw it, he immediately saw sculpture in it. It came in on a Thursday. He started in on a model of it on Friday, had it finished by Monday, and showed it to Truman on Wednesday. That's how fast this thing went down. The story behind the statue, the Iwo Jima Monument, began with a rush to put two of them together, model it, pull a mold off of it, and cast two of these for FDR's seventh war bond drive. And those two were put on flatbed vehicles and hauled all over the United States. As a matter of fact, they were accompanied by the remaining soldiers who lived from that flag raising. After the tour was over with, these two plaster models were then given to, one was given to the Marine Corps Recruit Depot at Paris Island, South Carolina, and the other one was given to the Marine Corps facility at Quantico. Now the one at Quantico collapsed and no longer exists in its, own, in its original form. So that means the first of the originals was now gone. The second one is at Paris Island, South Carolina. It's also made out of plaster and it's in terrible shape and unless something is done to take care of it, it will be gone soon. Now in 1960, the Rosen brothers commissioned De Weldon to pull that mold back out and recast one for the Rose Gardens in Cape Coral. And that one is made out of cast stone. It was designed to survive outdoors. And the way it stands now, it looks like it will be the only one remaining in the end. In 1957, Leonard and Jack Rosen flew over what is now Cape Coral. They purchased the land and built the first home in 1958 and named it Cape Coral. Cape Coral was their, their vision. They had a vision of having a, a, a Cape Coral Gardens. The Rosens um, opened the Cape Coral Gardens in 1964. They were only open a few years. It had a dolphin pool, it had a Hawaiian lagoon with very exotic trees, 40,000 rose bushes. Waltzing Waters was there, that's where it started. But there were many busts in the gardens of presidents and celebrities, and the well-known Iwo Jima Memorial. The gardens closed in 1970, and, and it really was just left to go into disrepair. Van it was vandalized. In 1980, Mike Gimmel, a Marine, decided to take a look at the statue in the gardens. So he, he went in and, and found it and saw what a terrible state it was in. The statue was taken from the gardens and, and uh, moved to Del Prado. Felix de Weldon was called back. And as the story goes, Felix de Weldon just broke down and cried when he saw what happened. 
to the statue or monument. Anyway, he went ahead and, and restored it, and it, it was on Del Prado for quite a few years. I remember seeing it, and uh, we were all proud to see it there. A few years later, or 19, it was moved to Del Prado in 1980, and a few years later, it was moved to uh, its present location. We can never take for granted what these Americans did for us in 1945 and what Americans heroes continue to do today. I would ask the young generation out there, a personal plea for me to you, get out from behind the computer, get out from behind your video games, volunteer at a VA hospital, meet some of these veterans from the Second World War in Korea and Vietnam, and cherish their stories because that's what it's about. That's the American pictorial right there in front of you. Well, the story of Iwo Jima, that was a battle that was of a tactical nature more of than a strategic nature. What was happening is that the B-29s that were flying from Saipan and Tinian and Guam to Japan, that was a 1,300 mile flight one way. And when they flew towards Japan, they flew near Iwo, this island called Iwo Jima. And Japanese had fighter bases on there and they were attacked going to Japan and coming back from Japan. And they decided that because they were taking uh, losses to the crews and the aircraft, um, that they should take the island and utilize the three airfields that were there so that they could provide fighter escort but more importantly, for B-29s that were severely damaged or run out of fuel, could land on the airfields in Iwo Jima. When I look at the statue, and I think it was for the same thing that the, where the troops were on the island. When they saw that flag go up, it was very emotional. They were having a very difficult time. There was a, a battle that was 24-7, 360 degree battlefield. And it went on for 36 days. And um, they lost an equivalent, th there's a lot of numbers as to casualties. The overall real number is about 28,000 altogether. That was one third of the invading force. This is the only battle in the Pacific where the marine casualties were larger than the Japanese casualties. There were 380 Medals of Honors awarded in all of World War II. On Iwo Jima, 23 won a Medal of Honor. Four Corpsmen won Medals of Honor. So there were 27 Medals of Honor awarded there, there is emotion to this statue when you look at it and you see these six people doing this flag raising, which became a symbol of not only the Marine Corps, but of World War II. And it has evolved into the courage and sacrifice of all of our veterans and all the wars we've been in since that time. It's gravitated to that because people don't relate to Iwo Jima as much anymore because there's not many people left. We, have, we don't have that many World War II veterans left. I know when a lot of people are there, they just break down and they cry. When we were doing the sandblasting, there was a young fellow that was on that sandblasting crew, mm -hmm. Vince Katina. And he said, boy, I'm glad I'm on this job. He says, I wouldn't have missed this for the world. He said, and he brought us down to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial that we have at ECO. And he pointed out, he says, that's my uncle. And his uncle was a Medal of Honor recipient. The only one on that particular plaque. Uh, and he says, it means the world to me. He says, yeah, and it brought him to tears. And I know there are times when I, when I talk about this, like I'm starting to break up. Because it, it means that much. The veterans that have come and seen it all come back to, um, to any of us that, that were there and they said it was a wonderful job. They really appreciate it. 
It means a lot of things. It all depends on whether you were on Iwo Jima or not. I was amazed at these people, you know. Um, the fact that only three survived Iwo Jima. And they had their own lives and problems when they came back. Uh, Ira Hayes became an alcoholic because of his experiences through there. He was the only surviving member of his original unit. And he always felt guilty about that. Uh, the one that survived the longest was John Bradley, the corpsman. And he just put that whole part of his life behind him. He put it in a box. He never told his family or anything about what he had seen or went through. Uh, our company, our, our, our division was actually put in reserve but when they got in there and found all the casualties in the 4th Marine Division, we landed then the, the very second day of, of the campaign. My brother-in-law was a major in there and he was killed the very first day in, in Iwo Jima. I was uh, carrying a rifle and I was a rifleman and uh, we were marching up towards the front lines. And next thing I know, uh, I was out completely. I didn't know I was out. Uh, I woke up all by myself in a great big open field and apparently uh, they gave me up for dead. But when I did wake up, I couldn't see anybody around and a uh, uh, long ways in the back I saw a little hut like back there and I started to walk in that direction. And it was a nurse that uh, took my rifle and laid it down and fixed my leg. and. Uh, she said, uh, okay, take this walkway back and get on the hospital ship, but, which shocked me because I, I was still capable of, uh, of uh, joining our, our company. Yeah, after I got out of service, uh, I was very much hated Iwo Jima. Didn't even want to talk about Iwo Jima until uh, I found out about this uh, statue here on, uh, over in Cape Coral being deteriorated, they were looking for uh, ways to uh, uh, rebuild it. So when I saw that, I went over and made a good sized contribution to start it. <coughs> anyway, uh, and that was the start, I guess, of uh, that being rebuilt. I just wanted to see that statue back up. Belongs in the place in history. So. The Marine Corps lead came to the Parks and Recreation Department after Hurricane Charlie to let us know that they felt that the statue suffered some significant damage. As we saw the deterioration get worse, the fund was put together at the Cape Coral Community Foundation with Craig T. Fuller's name on it, and they were raising money for the refurbishment of the Iwo Jima statue. The Craig T. Fuller group was formed um, with basically having a conversation with um, Jerry Fuller, Craig's father, uh, trying to find out how we can honor his his death from, in Afghanistan, um, and what did what meant the most to Craig, um, and it was the statue came to mind. The day that Craig was killed, he was coming back from a small village, and he had just got done delivering food supplies, and he was helping to fix. Um, the septic system and the water system and making sure that this village had everything that they needed because they were pretty much cut off because of the Taliban. Originally, um, we knew that the statue, uh, just from the visual inspection of it, that it was, in, it was pretty badly deteriorated. None of us having any knowledge of what it would take to restore it, we, were, we just had one goal in mind, that it needed to be restored. Um, there were some numbers thrown around, maybe 25,000, 30,000, we didn't know. Um, so that's what we set our sights on originally, was $25,000. I thought that would be a very obtainable goal. Um, but as we did further research and met more people and really understood what it would take to restore it and how badly it was just disintegrating from the inside out, um, we later learned that it might be 60,000, 80,000, over 100,000. Um, the numbers kept going the, up. The numbers just kept going up and up and up, and, you know, we were on a slippery pole going, how are we going to do this? And we decided that we were going to do this big event, it was going to take place on Valentine's Day. So we were going to play off of Valentine's Day, and we were going to make it to the love of our soldiers. 
We had about uh, 1,500, 2,000 people that were actually at this event at JC Park, and it was just incredible to see the community actually come together and really appreciate the one moment that we had, we had strived so hard to achieve. And it was to really just bring the recognition to the fact that our military gives up everything for us, and that's what that statue symbolizes. It's, you know, the Marine Corps symbol. And everything that they do is about that statue. Without the Fuller Group, I'm not sure how long it would have taken to provide the resources necessary for this large of a project. With the dwindling city revenues, the city was not in a position to take this project on by itself. So credit goes to the Craig T. Fuller folks and the Cape Coral Community Foundation for spearheading the effort in order to get the funding started. The Parks and Recreation Department really didn't have a great idea on how to restore a statue of this magnitude. I was looking for individuals that could assist. George Colum was on the committee with myself, and council member Bill Diley was at it. We were joined by a fourth individual who came into my office prior to the bids being submitted and said he was a concrete restorer from Iowa and his expertise was in concrete restoration and what we had was really a big piece of concrete out there that needed a lot of work and needed to be restored. Don Meek was his name. Uh, it was Don's expertise that really brought this project to a successful completion. Well, my expertise has to do with the structural aspects of the uh, monument. And um, so I, I bring 30 plus years of experience in uh, the restoration of concrete type structures. So I was the engineer and um, I had total control over the, the project. Since I knew a lot about restoration, I knew that I would not be able to find a sculptor that could do the restoration on the inside that would know as much about the restoration inside as I would or would be as familiar with that as I would. So I had to select a, uh, a sculptor that I knew that could be very um, cooperative and uh, that, that I could lead them through the process of the interior restoration. I selected D.J. Wilkins because I knew that D.J. Wilkins was a, a local contractor. I wanted to keep the, the money uh, locally because it's local money that's uh, provided for this uh, monument. Plus he was, after interviewing him, I could see that he has great knowledge and a background on this structure and also he was very cooperative. I started my public art career here in Fort Myers, 1982. I built 23 of the 28 public sculpture pieces that we have in the area. So this type of work has been my ongoing career uh, for the last 30 years. Some of them include the Panther Monument, the Seven Portrait Bust in Harborside, Uncommon Friends, the Civil War statue, that's in Centennial Park called Second Regiment Infantry, U.S. Colored Troops. Thomas Edison at Edison College, Edison at the Edison Home, Henry Ford, Mina Edison are some of the ones that you might be familiar with. When we started in, the re started in to restore it, we didn't know what we were getting into. But then whenever we started exploring it, we found that the surface underneath of all of this coatings and stuff had Felix de Weldon's original tool marks in it. We wanted to preserve that surface. We found out we could not. What we ended up having to do was sandblast all of this surfacing material off, and in the process we ended up taking off all the original surface work that he did. So what we did was put new surface back on the entire thing restruck it with the same pattern of, of tool marks and so forth that would have been de Weldon's. The restoration process itself, like I said earlier, uh, required that we sandblast everything off of it. But once we did that, there were over 250 feet of cracks in it, some of them as much as half inch wide. Our consulting engineer, Don Meek, studied this whole thing. He is an expert and concrete stone restoration. This is made out of cast stone. 
and we rewrote a plan for the restoration. It included injecting epoxy into ports that are set along all of these cracks and literally bonding the piece back to its core. There was a gap between the core and the outside skin because there was plaster used on the inside of it to hold it to its frame. That had disintegrated. It turned into something that looked like drywall mud. We had to drill 65 inch and a half holes in this and flush that all out. We started filling it with the Sika 212 flowable grout. We worked our way up until we got all the way to the top. Now the core and the outside skin have no void. Then we went along and set plastic ports along each of the cracks and then sealed the surface of the cracks between the ports and injected epoxy in it until it went from port to port to port as we capped it off and literally closed all of those cracks. Once that was done, we started in recoating the surface with a very, very special material uh, which we could re-strike all the tool marks in. The surface that goes on that, the color surface you, you see now, the bronze surface, is made of powdered bronze and forms of acrylic. It's water-based. It has a 10 to 15 year UV life and then that's coated with a sealer that also has a 10 to 15 year UV life. The granite that is used on a pedestal base was provided by a company headed by George Furlan. They got hooked into this job just like we did. And you, this is the one thing about this job. When you're involved, you get involved. Uh, everything comes together. Everything has meaning to it. The whole idea of the statue, what it did, who it did it for, you know, what it meant. and. Uh, recognizing the fact that we got a, a kind of a precious piece of artwork here by a guy who created it who is world renowned Felix de Weldon. The statue for the longest time has not been really well understood. The one we have has often been mistakenly called a replica a replica of the one in Washington DC. It is not. The replica has to come second. This came first. It is the original. The one in Washington, D.C. can be said to be an enlargement of it. The people of Cape Coral have got something that's absolutely precious. Has got the best of the Iwo Jima monument. This photograph turned into this monument is the most recognized symbol of World War II in the world. And we have it. This wonderful statue which you have saved it re represents all who have served and all who will serve. Whatever their rank or branch or component, they are America's finest, and you are a great community for remembering that. And Cape Coral, on behalf of the 80,000 members of the Marine Corps League and the 1,000 detachments we have onshore and offshore, I want to personally thank you for doing what you have done to preserve this has actually brought me back to a place of gratitude where I actually want to give some contribution because it's all about the veterans. You know, it started out, it was all about Craig. And now it's more. Now it's about our local community. It's about what this area can actually offer and with this being one of three originals. It touched my heart in such a way I can't even explain it. Doesn't I can't even try to put it into words. But to really see what we were able to mm -hmm. do and really make happen. We didn't just talk about it, we did it. And we got to see what our love was able to do. I'm pretty proud of what we did. I feel that we did a, a first rate job. <laughs>